France, a nation destined by excellence and empire to create some of the greatest feats of engineering the world has ever seen. France was led by rulers who compared themselves to gods and who waged bloody warfare across the continent. Their quest for perfection drove this nation to build on an unimaginable scale. Notre Dame is a structure of breathtaking innovation. But their wretched extravagance led to revolution, bringing the empire to the brink of ruin. From the chaos emerged a conqueror for the ages. Napoleon is a force of nature. His single-minded goal, empire on the scale of Rome. In 1163, Paris, an army of construction workers pulling endless loads of limestone swarm over the Ile de la Cité, an island in the middle of the River Seine. The site has been sacred for thousands of years. It was first a Druid shrine. That was transformed into a Roman temple for the god Jupiter and later became a destination for Christian pilgrims honoring St. Denis, who was tortured here and beheaded. Now, the King of France has ordered a new grand cathedral that will be the envy of all of Europe. That king was Louis VII. The cathedral is Notre Dame. To this day, among the most magnificent ever built, Allons enfants de le petit, le jour de gloire est arrivé. The day of glory has arrived. Hello, I'm Peter Weller. I learned the Marseillaise, perhaps the world's most passionate national anthem, about 15 years ago when I decided to take some time off and come here to the streets of Paris and retrace the steps of the French Revolution. But the immediate legacy of the French Revolution was by no means days of glory. It was a reign of reactionary terror that left France in political chaos with headless corpses and eventually brought on Napoleon. Democracy was to come later. But just as the foundations of democracy are bathed in blood, so are they also bathed in beauty. And the glory and beauty of France endure in its invention, innovation, in the arts and sciences, in its civil planning and architecture, and in its incomparable facility to build like a cathedral. The word cathedral does not just infer some big old church, generically. It's taken from the word cathedra, meaning seat. It is the seat of the bishop or the archbishop, the pope's representative in a particular parish or district. This is the cathedral of Paris, Notre Dame de Paris, Our Lady of Paris dedicated to the Virgin Mary. It ain't bad, is it? Matter of fact, it's probably the world's most famous church. Now, before this, in the early Middle Ages, churches were built in a style called Romanesque, using elements of real ancient Rome, like columns and capitals. Romanesque churches were short and fat and squatty, with big, thick walls, little bitty windows, barrel vaults, rounded arches. Even the Romanesque sculpture was austere and solid. But the churches didn't hold a lot of folks. And the Bishop of Paris, Maurice de Soli, not only wanted a church that would fill up with thousands, he wanted a church that would inspire awe. De Soli was regarded as a Christian icon in France. After years of bloody fighting, he and Louis VII wanted to consolidate their control over the feudal lands of France. Their great cathedral would be the cornerstone of that new regime and a symbol of their awesome authority. It would be built in a way never before seen on Earth. 
Maurice was uh, the bishop uh, of Paris at a moment when uh, Paris really was a boom town. Uh, Louis the Seventh uh, established Paris definitively as the capital uh, of the Kingdom of France. I think Maurice wanted to, to build a building that was worthy of the status of the city and men of enormous wealth and power. For two centuries, from the 1100s to the 1300s, that it took to build Notre Dame from soup to nuts is a period we call Gothic. But originally, Gothic was a disparaging term. Isn't that always the way when the next generations don't like anything that came before? Gothic falsely meant of the gods or barbaric. But Gothic is majestic, with tall decorative spires and thin lancet windows and round rose windows and stained glass and huge, massive piers inside, wide naves. When you think Gothic, think vertical. The Gothic, one of its primary characteristics is the sense of uh, both spaciousness uh, and scale uh, and uh, extreme lightness, both structural lightness and then uh, an interior filled uh, with light filtering in through the stained glass windows. It presented a, a kind of new vision or new image of, of, of heaven um, to, to the worshiper. Notre Dame would be the length of a football field with walls towering 100 feet into the air, so big that it would engulf de Sully's old church, which continued to hold services during the early years of Notre Dame's construction. Scaffolding provided a framework for lifting heavy equipment and materials, wooden braces, and stonework for constructing the vaults. An ingenious man-powered wheel crane mounted at the top of the scaffolding, was used to lift the heaviest material. A man or two would have gotten in the wheel and uh, essentially like a hamster and hoisted the materials up. To build the cathedral, thousands of workers would spend their entire lives erecting these walls. Each mason seems to have had a mark uh, which he would carve into the blocks so that uh, they would get paid uh, by the piece. One often has the romantic notion that uh, each stone was a kind of carved prayer, uh, but uh, it was much more uh, uh, practical than that. Uh, if there was no money, there was no work. So many thousands of tons of stone were needed that it started a craze called the Cult of Carts, wherein men, noblemen, and commoners would hook themselves to ox carts and pull the stones, seeking absolution along the way. Now, as opposed to Rome and the Renaissance and even now, where architecture is deductive, that means it's thought out on paper according to mathematical proportions, Gothic architecture was additive. Some of these churches were just drawn in the dirt, and then they went up. It's not to say that they didn't have a plan, but if they made a mistake, they added a pier or a wall or a pointed arch. Now, the thing with Notre Dame is that the weight of these stones, the downforce was so incredible. They also had the added problem of the wind because they were building up. Subsequently, they invoked this fantastic engineering element called the flying buttress. The flying buttress is this sort of half arch which displaces the weight out and then down. Notre Dame was so magnificent that it started a craze of Gothic building throughout Northern Europe, even before it was half finished. In the past, builders with soaring ambitions had always been stymied by gravity. The crushing weight of a stone ceiling created too much outward stress on the walls. It may have even started out as an ingenious type of scaffolding to support the walls. But now, as architects scrawled out brilliant blueprints in the shadows of the rising structure, the solution of the flying buttress would become a design element for the ages. With this support, Load-bearing walls could contain large cutouts for majestic windows that previously were impossible. The walls would have been too weak. <laughs> 